Welcome to the second basic lecture for the deep learning for microscopy course. So in this one, we will cover the image analysis topic after we've discussed machine learning in the first lecture. And then in the next lecture, we will combine these two different topics. Before we can talk about image analysis, we first need to discuss how images are represented by computers. Right? So we need to discuss digital image representation. Let's start with color images, right? So the kind of images that are, for example, taken by your um, smartphone cameras. Right? So these images are represented as these grids of value that have the heights, right? So this is the H dimension, and the widths, this is this W dimension, right? And so this gives us the size of the image. In the case of the one we see here, 512 by 512. And then we have an additional dimension, which are the channels, right? So these are three for color images. You see them represented over here. But this means for each of these 512 by 512 positions, we have three different values. And the first value encodes you know, the intensity of the red color, the second, the intensity of the green color, and the third, the intensity of the blue color. And we call these positions or point in the image a pixel, right? So in this case, we have 512 by 512 pixels, and each pixel has three different values. And these values can take the range from zero, which means no intensity, to 255, which is the maximal intensity. And if we look at a few examples here, right, sort of the pixel that would correspond to this point would have the values 0, 0, 255. Because as you see, the point in here is, is mostly blue. So this means we have no um, red component, we don't have any green component, but all the intensity is in the blue component. And I mean, this is of course a bit of approximation here, and the pixel would also be smaller, but I hope you get the idea. Right? If we go to this pixel here, which has a red color, then the first value, right, the run corresponding to red, has the intensity 255, and all the other values are zero. And if we have some mixture of colors, like here where we have white, then we have also intensities for all the three color channels. In the case of white, all the colors would have the maximum intensity. So this is how we represent kind of normal color images. This is a bit different for scientific images, right? So for example, for microscopy images. So there, the number of channels is most of the time not three, right? Because we don't have these color images, but rather images are taken with some other kind of uh, camera that often only has sort of a, a single channel, right? So only like a single color that is imaged. And in that case, we call, uh, we talk about single channel images or grayscale images. We can also have multiple channels if we have some um, multispectral or multiplexing imaging, but then the number of channels can also be different than three. So this is the first major difference. The other difference is also that sort of the value range of our pixels can be different, right? So instead of 255 being the max value, often we have the roughly 650,000 as the um, uh, max value. And this depends on the number of bits we use to represent with these numbers. So this is sort of not so important uh, in detail how this works, but just to take away, right? It's not always 255 as a maximum value per pixel. And if we go to our image here, and then what we have is 1,024 pixels and 1,344 pixels. And this image, right, it shows a microscopy image with nuclear stain. Right? So the bright areas in these images show us nuclei. And we only have a single channel. Right? So each pixel just have a single value that corresponds to the fluorescence intensity at that position. Yeah, and now with this, we can discuss how we analyze images. So what we do in image analysis. And our goal here is to um, yeah, ask quantitative questions about the image or do some sort of quantitative analysis. A fairly simple example for our image here would be to extract the size distribution of nuclei. And we can divide this into two different subtasks. Right? So the first would be to sort of find all the individual nuclei. So basically these um, orange outlines that, that we show here, right? find those outlines or those masks for all the nuclei. And we also call this a segmentation task. And once we have this, we can then compute the size, basically the number of pixels for all of um, these objects we found, and then analyze the distribution. 
Yeah, so with this, let's turn to image analysis concepts that we can use in order to solve this fairly simple size extraction task, but that can also, of course, then be used for more complex tasks. And there are a couple of different important operations in image analysis, and we'll discuss a few here. Right? We'll talk about image filtering, about thresholding and morphological operations, then about instant segmentation, and finally about object level analysis. And we will combine these operations to solve the segmentation task, right? so finding all the nuclei, and then to extract their sizes. So the first thing we want to discuss is image filtering. And I mean, this is kind of a concept you're probably familiar with from um, yeah, image processing or, or social media, also Photoshop, right, where we take an input image, right, like our image here, and then we apply some filter that com yeah, computes a different representation of the image, as you see here on the right hand side. And here we were concerned with fairly simple filters. One very important example is removing noise, right, sort of the yeah, to remove sort of noisy acquisitions in the imaging process. So this is the first filter we want to do with this, and we can remove noise by smoothing an image. This is also often called low-pass filtering, and this is done by this um, Gaussian smoothing, and we want to explain this a bit more now. Right? So the basic idea here is that we want to average our signal, right? so the signal being the pixel intensities, in a local window. And we do this by applying this sort of intensity distribution to our image, right? So this is sort of this uh, 2D profile. I mean, we call this a uh, Gaussian because this is like this famous Gaussian curve, but basically it has high intensity here in the center, which would correspond to a center, the center pixel in a local window, and then has lower intensity here in the surrounding. And the um, idea here now behind smoothing is to apply this intensity profile to the image and use it to smooth out the pixel intensities and in this way to remove noise, right? Because noise means we have a single pixel that has a very different intensity to its surrounding. And if we smooth it out with the with profile, right, we will lower this difference in the intensities to the surrounding. Now, in order to apply this to an image, we need to take the profile we see on the left-hand side and create a new small image out of this. And so we often call this a kernel, but you can think about this kernel just like a small image. And what this does is it approximates this intensity profile, right? And so you can see the corresponding kernel for our Gaussian intensity profile over here. And it's basically this five by five grid where we have high intensity in the middle and lower intensities here on the corner, right? And we get these values in here by evaluating right, sort of this intensity profile at the corresponding positions. Right? So for the middle here, right, we evaluate this and get this value here in the middle. We have a high intensity, and we do the same for these other positions here on the outside. And um, then in order to apply this to the window, we apply this in the so-called sliding window fashion. So what this means is we take our kernel, which corresponds right here, to the small three by three window that's shown here now, but this, this is the kernel we've seen on the previous slide. And we first apply it sort of in the top left of our image, right? You see this in the animation here. When it was applied to the top left, right, this corresponds here to this position in the image. And what we then do is we take all the pixels that overlap with the kernel here, right? For example, on the top left, and we compute the product with the value in the kernel, right? So basically we go here, we take the values that are here in the kernel, we take the corresponding um, pixel values, we multiply them together for this position, and then what we do is we sum up everything. And then we get the output pixel here, right? So when we were here on the lock, uh, top left, right? We would take all the values here from the kernel, write them here in, in this one pixel, and then we just shift the kernel, run to the right, do the same, do the same, and basically apply this over the whole image. And this way, we can smooth out our image with the kernel that we've defined beforehand, and we get this output image here, right? And basically, you see that this does what, what the name says, right? It smoothes out the signal, and in the smoothing problem, uh, sorry, smoothing process, it also removes noise. And 
we can also map other operations um, yeah, to this concept, right? So in, in the case of this Gaussian kernel, we were smoothing the image, but if we choose different kernels, we can also achieve different tasks, for example, finding edges, right? So if we um, have a different intensity obesity profile, right, like this one shown here, which is called the Laplace profile, but that's not so important. What we have is a very high intensity in the middle, but then low um, neg or negative intensities here on the outside, right? So this is what you see in this intensity profile here, and this is how the corresponding kernel would look, right? High intensity in the middle and the negative um, intensity in the surrounding. So if we apply this to an image, we will find edges, right? Because an edge is basically uh, yeah, somewhere where we have to transition in pixel values, and this kernel here will highlight them. So we can see this applied to our image, and in practice, this edge kernel is often combined with smoothing so that we find real edges and not just noise in the image. But if we apply this kernel now in the sliding window fashion as before to our image, this is the output that we get, right? And so sort of what, what this does is highlight the edges in the image. I mean, here it's maybe a not so clear to see, but sort of for these nuclei that are very bright, like this one here, we will see that we have high intensity on the edges of the nucleus. And there are also other edge filters that would probably work better for the image, but I hope that the concept is clear. And basically by finding the correct kernel, we can get filters that highlight certain aspects of the image or that um, remove unwanted edge uh, elements, right? Like the smoothing kernel we had before that removes noise. So this is the first important concept that we wanted to know image filters, how they are formulated and applied to images. Yeah, now let's continue to uh, in our task that we want to solve, which is right, to find all the individual nuclei. And um, we continue now with our smoothed image. Right? So this is the image here, where we applied our smoothing filter, and we want to process this further. And the next step we want to solve is just finding out which of the pixels correspond to a nucleus. Right? Because before, we can say sort of where the individual nuclei are, we just need to know sort of for each pixel, is it in a nucleus or not, without knowing sort of anything about nucleus intensities. And we can solve this by thresholding. So this is a very simple operation. We basically go over every uh, single pixel and we look if the intensity is above or below a certain value. If it's um, above this value, we set the output to one. And if it's below the value, we set the output to zero. So this is kind of the result you see here on the right hand side, if we apply this, this threshold. Um, and the question is now, how, how can we find a good threshold? Um, there are different options for this. The, a very simple option is sort of just to look at the histogram of pixel intensities, right? So basically take each intensity value we have for all the pixels and plot them in a histogram like here. And then what we'll often see are kind of these two different peaks, right? So the one here for the lower intensity, this would correspond to the background, right? So these are all the black pixels where we don't have a nucleus, so that we are not interested in. And then um, this right peak here of the higher intensities, this um, corresponds to the pixel that are actually in a nucleus. And then we would choose an intensity that's somewhere in between these two peaks. For our example in uh, image that we have, a good value here is 42, right? So this is now how we get the output image to the right that we've already seen by applying the threshold of a pixel intensity 42, right? And then all the pixels that are now one correspond to pixels in a nucleus because they have high intensity. Okay, so now we have this sort of what we often call a binary mask that tells us where in the image is a nucleus or not. Uh, the next thing we want to do is then to take this binary mask and make individual nuclei out of this. And we will do this basically by putting all the pixels of a mask that don't touch other pixels in a single object. Um, we will talk about this idea soon, but you can already see that in the image that we have, there is a problem with this idea, namely that sort of the masks of different nuclei are touching. Right? So you can see this quite well here, right? So we have like the two different masks or blobs corresponding to nuclei here, but um, they touch in the middle, right, via this small bridge in here. 
And if we were just to, uh, to go over the image and put each sort of non-touching mask in one object, we now have a problem, right? We, we were, this would be a single object, but this corresponds to two underlying um, nuclei. And so in order to deal with this, we can now turn to these morphological operations, which act on these kinds of binary masks that we hear. And there are different kinds of these operations. Um, an important one that we want to use is erosion. Right? So this basically takes a binary mask, right, as it we see here, right, the pixels that are zero would correspond to our background, the pixels that are one to our foreground or our um, nuclei, and then erosion just shrinks these masks, right? So basically, if we erode this mask, we just re, um, remove the pixels in the foreground that are kind of on the border of the mask, and we would get an image like this here. There's also the opposite operation, which is dilation, which takes a mask and sort of expands it to the surrounding pixels. And sort of in practice, these operations work fairly similar as the uh, filters that we've discussed beforehand, but they're defined for these binary images or mask images. And um, if we now apply this operation to our image and apply it five times, so basically a row by five pixels, we see that we can now separate right, the object that was touching here. Right? So here we see in the original mask, right, we had this sort of bridge that connected the two nuclei. And now by eroding this five times, we've removed it. Right? So we see that these binary operations, they can be used to yeah, change these masks, change this foreground, and are quite helpful. And in our task, right, they help us to separate objects that are wrongly joined in our image. And I mean, we see that we are not fully successful with this. Right? For example, here, we see that we still have joint nuclei, but we'll talk about this later. So right now, what we want to turn to is what we already discussed, right? we want to find the individual nuclei in this image. Because right, for now, we only have to have this mask that tells us where is the nuclei or not, but we don't know yet which of these masks correspond to individual nuclei. And for this, we now turn to this operation called connected components that will give us the instances. So we call this process also instance segmentation, right, where each object that we get is a separate instance. And we can do this with this connected component labeling. And, and, and to explain this, let's look at this very simple binary mask here. Now, in, in this case, sort of our, our foreground would be the, the black pixels and the background, these uh, light pixels. And right here, we just have this binary um, situation as we had it before, that we just know what is foreground and what is background. And now we want to separate this into individual objects. So what we do in connected component labeling, we see every sort of um, pixel in, in this foreground that is touching which is other um, builds an object or makes up an object. So we, we go over this image and sort of label all the pixels that touch in our mask with one color, right? So this is what you can see here. We have all the um, pixels here that touch. So this means they're sort of connected to the neighbor horizontally or vertically. In this case, we don't consider, right, sort of the uh, diagonal connections, but just straight horizontal or vertical connections. And then we label all the pixels that touch according to de this definition with one color. And of course, this would be one value, for example, one. And we see that we get then this component here. Right? And if we do the same for all the other pixels, right, we see that we get this six different colors or six different values. And now this gives us our individual instances. Right? And I mean, the, the way this algorithm uh, works is not so important for us, but it's a fairly common algorithm in image analysis that takes the binary masks and gives us these instances here right, by putting all the pixels that uh, touch into a separate instance. And now right, we can just apply this algorithm to the binary mask that we had for the nuclei here. And then we see that as a result, each nucleus is labeled with an individual color. And again, of course, each color here just corresponds to an individual ID or number. So we have now found all the nuclei here in our image and they're labeled sort of from one to some maximal number. And all the pixels of a given nucleus are also labeled with this number, which we can see visualized by this color here. So this now right, got us a, a long step towards this task that we want to solve of finding the individual nuclei.
but we still have two problems here. Right? We have some nuclei that are touching because their binary mask were touching. We've seen this before and we'll deal with this problem later. But we also now have the problem that the nuclei masks we have are actually smaller than the nuclei in the image. And, and remember, this is because we have eroded these binary masks. Right? So we have, um, in the steps before, taken the masks that we got from thresholding and then we, move, we removed pixels on the border so that we were able to separate them via the connected components. But this led to the problem, leads now to the problem right, that we've removed these outer pixels. So if we measure the, the sizes, which we want to ultimately do, we would measure sizes that are too small. And so now we've turned to sort of a final algorithm to deal with this problem, which is the watershed algorithm, or also called watershed segmentation. And the idea behind um, this is sort of that we grow regions. So we start from individual regions, which are called labels here in the image, right? So this would be sort of this first region here, this region, and this region. And then we define a heat map, right? So this is sort of the curve that can, you can see here. And I mean, you can think about this similar to like the we left uh, or the, the heat of some landscape. Um, and, and we'll see how this works for our image in a second. But the idea is basically to take this sort of initial regions and grow them out until they touch in the peaks of this heat map, right? So this is what you can see here. We, we took sort of the green initial region over there and then we grow it. And we also grow sort of this orange region in the middle and they touch at the point between the two initial regions that is highest. And the same happens for label two and label three over here. And this algorithm is called the watershed because if we had like a landscape, this would correspond to the watersheds, right? So if, if it would rain, so if the rain from uh, that falls uh, here would sort of um, fall down to kind of this um, region um, for all everything that's to the left of, of this watershed and to this reason that's to the right of this watershed. So this is kind of just how this algorithm was inspired by yeah, the way sort of um, we rainfalls in topological landscapes, but we can do it for image analysis and use it to grow out regions. And this is exactly what we want to do now, right? We have sort of our initial regions, right? Which were these um, kind of nuclei found by the connected component labeling. But as we've discussed, right, these are too small because we have eroded them. And then we want to grow them out. And for this, we use now the edge filter. Remember, right, we uh, computed this in the beginning and we use this as our heat map because right, this has high values on the borders between nuclei. And this is exactly where we want to separate nuclei from each other, sort of where, where the edge between them is or the boundary is. So this gives us then the two component we need for this watershed algorithm, right? So this initial labels here, right? These are our connected components and the heat map, right? So the, uh, which defines the places where they touch when they grow these regions, this is our edge filter. And then finally, um, if, if we were just to apply sort of the watershed with these two inputs, then it actually would grow out the full image, right? Because we, uh, would sort of not stop and, and also flood the background with the scheme. So as a third thing, we also take into account this mask, right? And this is just our initial foreground segmentation, the initial binary mask we had from thresholding. And taking all of these three inputs together, right? We grow out these regions and we grow them out either until sort of they hit another one of the regions according to the criteria of the heat map or until they hit the mask and go into the background. And with this, right, we get out sort of the grown out segmentation here. And this is now the result we wanted to have, where we have segmented all the individual nuclei and they have roughly the correct size now. Yeah, so this is now, right, we've combined a couple of different steps. We first did smoothing, then did thresholding, then um, we eroded the thresholded mask. We applied connected component to get this initial region. And then we applied the watershed to grow out this region back to the correct size. And with all of this, we've solved the segmentation task that we set out of finding the individual nuclei in the image. And then sort of the next task that we had, sort of this object level um, analysis is fairly simple, right? We basically now just need to go over this image 
And for each of the different masks or colors, we, we measure the size. So how many pixels have the value of a given nuclei. And then we can just plot them in, say, in a histogram, as we can you see here, right, which gives us basically the, the size uh, or buckets of the size and tells us the number of nuclei that have the size. And of course, we can also do other kinds of analysis with this. Right? We can measure average or other intensity statistics per nucleus, or we can answer right, whatever kind of object level questions that you're interested in for your research question. And we can also look at spatial distributions and relations between neighbors and so on with these results. So this sort of object level analysis is very powerful in order to, to ask quantitative questions about objects and images. But for all of this, right, what we first need to do is solve this instant segmentation task that we ran through now, where we can identify the individual objects. Yeah, and now let's get back to the problems that we've seen, right? So in, in the image we have, we have still a bunch of touching objects, right? Also these are sort of um, objects where our algorithm now would say this is a single object, but we know these are, these are actually two separate nuclei, right? So this one here, this one here. And the problem there was, right, that there are binary masks that we got from Swetschrodding were touching, and they were touching so closely that we could not separate them with the uh, uh, morphological operation that we applied. Right? So we see that this sort of fairly simple thresholding based segmentation has some limitation. And this here, of course, was a fairly easy task. Right? So the nuclei are fairly easy to separate from the background. And already in this task, right, we see that we couldn't fully solve this job. And so this is why we will now in the next lecture go back to machine learning and deep learning, where instead of solving this, um, with this simple thresholding approach, we instead want to learn how to solve this task from examples. But just to say, right, all the image analysis concepts that we've discussed, right, there are still important steps, even when we use machine learning for the, sorry, to answer the full research questions. So everything we learn now is important sort of as a basics for the things that we want to cover in the course. But for these segmentation tasks and also other tasks, we will turn to the more powerful machine learning and deep learning methods. Yeah, so this was everything we wanted to cover in the image analysis introduction as last time, right? So it's if you didn't understand all the details, this is really not so um, important. I mean, if you did, that's great. But if not, right, you can still participate in the course. Don't worry about this. The most important thing is to understand like these concepts, right? What, what do we mean when we say we apply a filter to an image? What do we mean with this object level analysis and so on? And for those of you who want to learn more, we will also um, give some further reading in the video description. And then in the final image, we will see how we combine the two concepts we've covered so far and use machine learning for image analysis.